we've built in monitoring for end of life and end of support into our platform that actually nudges developers and in managers, hey, you should pay attention to this dependency or this code that it's going end of life. We alert for those things. And so that was my kind of first aha moment where somebody's actual safety is on the line due to not maintaining your software. And that became a big passion story for me. This is All Quiet on the Second Front, a podcast where boring conversations around defense tech and national security come to die. Join me, Tyler Sweat, and my Second Front comrades as we dismantle the mundane, cut through the bureaucratic BS to demystify the world of defense tech. But be warned, this is not a typical government podcast. Ready to get weird? Welcome to another episode of All Quiet on the Second Front. Uh, I am not your host, Tyler Sweat. Um, he's out for this week. Uh, my name is Enrique Ot. I am the Chief Strategy Officer here at Second Front. I'm calling in here from London, England, where I hang my ad. We were trying to expand Second Front out there to the UK and NATO and uh, other parts of the world. Uh, some of you may know me from my past life as the CTO of Second Front Systems uh, and uh, my previous work in the Air Force at DIUX and Kessel Run. So welcome to the podcast. Uh, got an exciting episode today. With us in the studio is Jeremy Vaughn. Uh, Jeremy Vaughn is the CT or CEO of Start Left, uh, which is an application security company. And we're going to have a great conversation about security, about startups, about national security, and honestly, whatever else uh, we end up talking about. So, Jeremy, welcome. Hey, Rigue. Thank you for the invite. And um, it looks like we're both special guests. <laughs> yeah. Yes, we are. Uh, so, you know, Jeremy, let's start off. Look, every great villain or every great hero has an origin story. Um, what is your origin story? What kind of trauma in your life led you into being a founder of a startup and working in cybersecurity? Because uh, as we all know, this is a, a horrific industry that I've never uh, tried to force my children into. So uh, what is your origin story that brought you to this world? <laughs> trauma. Oh man, I like the question. That's that's very good. Um, you know, I guess I guess you could start out with childhood trauma. <laughs> um, so like, uh, I've always been entrepreneurial. Um, always been into new things, and you know, um, kind of grew up when my parents got divorced, uh, poor, um, right? And so I was like, man, I like really nice things. I want a nice car. I want you know to to get out of this small town. Um, when I graduate. Right. And so there's more opportunity outside of the country. And so, um, I basically did a lot of odd and ends businesses from landscaping, you know, mowing lawns to cleaning, you know, commercial buildings and things like that. And, um, you know, made a lot of money as a teenager and that kind of entrepreneurial, you know, spirit stuck with me, um, all the way through. And, um, you know, trauma was, college i hated it yeah. um I, I struggled and got through on the five-year plan and then um you know went into corporate environment and hated it you know i was i've always been a rebel and i'm always like why do we do these things this way and always questioned you know authority and why why can't we make this more efficient you know why is this process this way and um really came out to be like an innovator um, in, you know, finance and was part of a, uh, really early on, um, web startup in the finance space back in early two thousands. And it really opened my eyes to, um, building a, 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 a digital business and taking advantage of the internet and, um, going and raising capital. I didn't do all those things. I was just kind of there experiencing it. And I, right. I was like, wow that's really cool. I want to do that one day. Right. And, um, then the recession hit and, uh, that led me to, um, I had to do what I had to do. And that was where my entrepreneurship really kicked in. And, um, my, my wife, uh, at the time was pregnant and I was scared. I wasn't making any money. And I was like, okay, what do I do? And so one of my buddies was a software engineer. Um, we were college buddies for several years and I was like, Hey, 
why don't we create a business around software development? And, you know, we, we built a business model and we went to market and, you know, that was kind of the, the beginning stages of how I got into technology and, um, you know, went from there. No, that's awesome. I, I always appreciate when I talk to entrepreneurs, like true entrepreneurs, it's like, there's a lot of people that throw the word innovation around. Ooh, I got a creative idea. Yeah. Creative ideas and you know, dime a dozen true entrepreneurship, where it doesn't matter what industry you're in between mowing lawns or finance or tech, the fact that you're able to say, Hey, let's just solve a problem. It's like, get the hands dirty and actually get it done. So that is awesome. And, uh, it takes a certain, uh, personality type, uh, to struggle through that. And so actually what was it like? So you didn't come from the software industry. You kind of joined the software industry post recession. Uh, you got a friend who's a software developer. What was it like transitioning from finance into software, uh, especially because you, you know you ended up getting the cybersecurity side of the house? What was that transition like? Um, it was it was interesting at first, right? Because like, just like in cybersecurity, you know, trying to get into like security in the software development, right? It's you have to learn both languages, right? And so going back to then, um, I had to learn a new language. I had to learn software development. I had to learn, you know, scrum agile, you know, all, all of the terminology that we use, but I think I aligned really, really well with, with, um, software is in, in the industry because I'm a, I'm a learner, I'm a lifeline a lifelong learner. And so, you know, re I've continuously reinvented myself you know, every probably like seven to 10 years of hey, when I hit a challenge or I see a problem or an opportunity, um, I don't let my lack of knowledge or skill, um, hold me back. And, um, I think I just, I just like R and D, right? Like I go super deep on reading. Yep. I go, I, I want to solve this problem. Um, I want to understand everything and I surround myself with much more smarter people than me and just ask a lot of dumb questions until I get smarter. <laughs> and then, um, then it just kind of opens my eyes to, okay, here's how we attack the problem. Here's the business model. Here's some tech that we can use and, um, and go from there. And so it's, it's really just, you know, it's a, it's a continuous improvement, right? Um, yeah. like the software industry. <clears throat> okay. So I think I start, you know, I'll, I'll go a little off topic on this, on the tech side, but with that kind of personality type of, you like to do R and D, you like to solve problems. What do you do for fun? Do you have any hobbies? I feel like you're like the kind of guy that's a mechanic or something, run, builds a car or I don't know. What do you, what do you do for fun with this kind of mindset? Um, honestly, I get out of technical stuff, um, completely. And, um, I, I also am a guy that is, uh, I would say. I'm social and I, I'm, I'm a little bit emotional, right? So like, I like to hang out with friends and family. I want, I like to maintain relationships. And, um, so a lot of my fun is doing kind of group activities, you know, whether it's mountain biking, you know, pickleball, um, I'm, I'm very active outside of sitting behind the computer, um, during the workday. Right. And so, um, I'm always like, Hey, let's go do this spontaneous, like hike trip or Island trip or mountain trip and, um, you know, get together and do things. So I, it's important to note though, it is hard to maintain like relationships outside of your business relationships. And yeah. majority of my friends are, you know, our investors or our partners or our clients. And, you know, um, it's, it just so happens that like you you build better relationships with those people just by, you know, hanging out with them after hours. Right. Um, so yeah, that's, you know, that's, that's very true. It's like, there's this kind of view. I'll see, we also have this view of a work-life balance. What is that work-life balance? But you're right over time, especially in the entrepreneurship startup ecosystem, it's not like a regular nine to five job. Like your startup is your life. And so your work-life balance ends up becoming other people in the industry, other people in the company, like midnight phone calls with my CEO, just because you know, we have to talk about something. So yeah, I totally understand where you come from on that. It, it is, a, it is a, it is a definitely a change in the, in the social scene. Yeah, it is. But yeah, it's, it's, it's cool. Cause it helps out the business and it helps your, out your, you know, personal social life too. But you did nail, nail it on the head. I love working on cars. I'm a car guy. Um, the problem with that is I would get very anxious if I started a project 
and I can't work on it like consistently and like yes. I go into the garage and stare at it and it's like just sitting there it would it would drive me nuts so until I get a little bit more free time I will not start a project <laughs> and get overly ambitious about that all right so talk to me about your current project what was called a project start left tell me about what it is you guys are doing like what like like again with any company you're found was like you see a need obviously in the space. And so what was that need you saw and, and what are you guys doing to tackle it? Yeah, I would say um, where, let me kind of go with the origin stories, plural, um, cause it kind of exposed like how we figured it out and you know, why the why behind the company too. Um, so like we started off as a ser services company um, and not really many people know that and so we developed a methodology called the chief product security office. Um, and it was really just an intuitive way of how can we bundle services that are complementary to like all these virtual CISO consulting firms that they're, that popped up, you know, five, six, seven years ago and really offer a complementary thing. And the reason why is we kind of realized like through our, our services is um, and Gardner references this is product focused DevOps is, you know, companies, organizational design is starting to move towards um, product teams and taking advantage of small, high performant teams focused on building world class software. And that's ultimately the purpose of DevOps. And I think a lot of people get that wrong. Oh, we have a CI CD pipeline. We're doing DevOps. Nope, that's not true. Um, how is your organizational structure um, uh, being designed? to do that. Right. And so along the lines of solving the kind of intangible problems that, you know, comes with a systematic program of culture, right? We all talk about culture, um, as DevSecOps and everybody's arguing about does is it sec DevOps or DevSecOps? Like who cares? Doesn't um, matter. like it's irrelevant. It, yeah. It, right. Like how are, how are you changing the culture and if you kind of go back to like Gene Kim and even all the books that he reads or, you know, uh, or references in his, his series is DevOps was really meant to, um, you know, provide a culture to build world-class software, right. And do it fast and protect the organization while doing so. And so I think, um, a lot of people are like, not really going back in, in, I've been in the industry for like 16, 17 years now. And like, a lot of the guys that and girls that you know I worked with at the beginning, they always gave me books to read. They always were like, "Here's how we solve problems." Here, and like, I don't feel like that's really happening. And like, people are just like adopting technology so fast, tools so fast that they're forgetting to take a step back and looking at the overall like, how do we solve this problem? And guess what? It's not just buying tools, right? And so I talk about org design culture. And ultimately at the center of all that Enrique is people, right? And so yeah. if we're just focused on tech, um, process and we're forgetting about the people, how do we empower people? How do we cause this change in culture and or design with people at the center? Um, that's how we actually solve these problems where we are still enabling that high performance teams to build world-class software for people, right? So. I would say we're one of the the only platforms that are focused heavily on people and through our services is that's how we learned is like, how do we do this as seamlessly as possible to get security built into product teams and really enable what DevOps should be doing, but also in inflicting the change of we're actually doing security in our work all day, every day, like we should be doing and right. So that's, that's kind of like what happened and what we're focused on the, or the why story though, which is, is my passionate uh, story. I don't know if you, if you did any research on it, but, um, my daughter is a type one diabetic. Um, we use mobile application to track her in an IOT device to track her blood sugars, you know, all day. This she's, she's almost 14 years old. Now this happened when she was eight. Um, the, the mobile app failed overnight and. When you're, when you change your yeah. behavior to trust a technology, you know, you tend not to wake up in, in the middle of the night, you trust that it's going to alert you. Right. And so it didn't alert us that night. And so I 
super basic way to find what happened is I just went on the iTunes store, the Apple store, and this particular medical device company did not update their mobile application in over two years. Now, how many times has the OS updated over two years? So that that is called software decay or code rot and configuration, uh, you know, starts to mess up and you lose features, right? And so she was a she was a 47 blood sugar at that time. It didn't notify us for wow. three hours. Yeah. So incredibly angry, but at the same time, like we're, we've built in monitoring for end of life and end of support and all these type of things into our platform that actually nudges developers and in managers, Hey, you should pay attention to this dependency or this code that it's going up, it's going end of life or whatever. So like we're, we, we alert for those things. And so that was my kind of first, um, aha moment where somebody's actual safety is, is on the line due to crappy software or not maintaining your software. And that is, that became a big passion story for me. That is a great, like, I love that story. And it's a great reason to build high quality code. Uh, interesting. I am also a type one diabetic. Uh, I got, oh, I, I'm adult onset. I actually became a type one diabetic, uh, very late in life, actually about five years ago. So I also, uh, have my continuous monitoring on me. My, my alarm went off last night, by the way, for a low. So yeah, I understand exactly what we're talking about because I entirely for the last few years have been relying on technology to manage my health and stuff. And it is you're right. And if the software goes out of date, the software goes bad, you know, you know, shit happens and these are like lives on the line. So the fact that you're, uh, I do like that when people get into tech for a real reason, not just to make money, but you get into tech because there's a real problem to solve that actually matters. That that's hugely important. So no, I have a good on you. Um, so that's I, our, I want to go. Yeah, sorry. Say again. I was gonna say that's our mission. I did. I did not know yeah. that about you. So um, yeah. thank you for sharing. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's it's a it's a horrible scenario. As if the 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 disease is not you know hard yeah. enough you know to maintain. So it's just you know when you finally get a little bit of uh, easier, um, it's just yeah. trust it, right? So. On a random side note, there's a whole uh, community out there of open source hackers for uh, diabetic devices, which is actually, I would not trust hacking my own, uh, but I'm glad that other people are playing around with that. So that's a lot. Uh, yes. Interesting. Um, I want to go back to something you said about the people and the learning. I totally agree with you. And one thing that you, you kind of alluded to was the ahistorical nature of how people look at software development. So people look at tools and they understand the tools and they know words. They know DevOps as a word. They know Agile as a word, CI, CD. And they buy tools related to those buzzwords. And the entire marketing in the industry is around these kind of buzzwords. But what seems to be lacking is the historical knowledge of how we got to where we were. What was the software industry like in the 1980s and 1990s that led to things like the Agile Manifesto? What was going on as we moved from data centers and hardware devices to cloud device that lead to the idea of different ways of doing configuration management, different ways of doing the re the need for CI, CD to accelerate that deployment into prod, the rapid iteration of set tech. And I think there's probably been a lack of education in our community. These young software developers, my, my kid's a computer science major uh, in college right now. Like, I don't think he understands the history of why they're using the tools they are. And to get to your point, like, why do you organize a culture? Why do you organize an organization? Why do you love a culture for a certain behavior? And I think in the lack of a historical view, we don't have the same cultural understanding of why we should be acting in certain ways. And organizations still go back to traditional org models, which then violates all the principles of Agile and DevOps. And so kind of with that, I know there's really like not even a question. It's like me just making a statement there, but like, how are you approaching this? So you talk about your platform uh, you know, focusing on people and focusing on cross and organization. How are you addressing this kind of nature of like giving understanding to someone about why we code the way we code? Yeah, it's interesting, right? So, um, we're our platform isn't built for everyone, and I think in the industry, you know, um, even our competitors, like we can easily show a difference in why our platform matters. If if keyword 
if an organization is going down the path of building out product focused DevOps teams, right? And so our in here, our platform is inherently designed to be flexible, to do that and, um, move with the evolution of the product operations that we're starting to see. And so kind of go back to history of, you know, at my previous, um, firm, uh, we built a, a whole consulting practice around DevOps and we demonstrated building out the, this team kind of methodology, um, in this org structure. And so when you look at, you know, like I said, Gene, Gene Kim ref references these same books, you know, the yeah. goal by Eli, Eli Goldratt, you know, where, how do you apply the Toyota production system to better manufacturing more throughput? Right. Um, and then, uh, the concept of like surgical teams, you know, when you go into a hospital, um, and there's a surgeon, the surgeon's in charge, right? He's the expert, you know, or she's the expert. Um, they're orchestrating all of the other experts in their res respective fields, but they're in a small team structure. And guess what? That small team structure is super efficient and they kind of can almost read the room and read what they're, what they need to do with each other, but they know they're going to get mentorship and guidance from each other. And it's just really, really productive and highly performant. And so, um, we did that in the, in our previous consulting firm and it led us to compete with our competitors, like faster delivery, three to five times faster. Like we deliver stuff in three months where our other competitors were delivering in six to nine months. And the CTOs and CIOs that we were our champions were like, how are you guys moving so fast? And how are you delivering such high quality software? And so. We're like, oh, we, we, we adopted cloud. We adopted CI CD. And by the way, we structure our teams like this. Yep. And you know, um, they're like, wow, we don't structure our teams like that internally. How did you, how did you learn to do that? And it, you know, it started off as like a, a philosophical, like, you know, do we do this? And, you know, after experimentation, it worked. Um, and so it, again, just following that methodology. And what's cool about that is, you know, Microsoft just came out with, uh, their kind of new methodology of, um, putting deputy CISOs on product teams. Right. And, uh, the focus is on incentivizing around security and security needs to come first. And so, um, you know, I wish I could say I was genius to see that, you know, 16 years ahead of time, but like, um, it, it's cool to see that methodology kind of following through on, okay, it's not just about the tech, it's the people, right? How do we take yeah. advantage? Cause everybody in software is really smart, right? But like, if you can't actually align them on a, a shared vision, a shared understanding, a shared mission, a shared goal on like what we're all doing together. Yeah. It's just, it's just chaos. And so you, you, you throw tools and all that kind of stuff in the middle of chaos. You're just creating more chaos. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you a question. I'm not sure if you have an answer for it, but I'll, I'll throw it out there anyway. So when you look at a well-organized product team, you generally have a mix of product managers, UX, UI designers, and engineers. You're now talking about throwing in kind of a, a security role to it, like a scissor role to it. But look at that core team, absent CISO, and you look at the role of UX, UI. I, I've had this. I've had this debate now with multiple people, and it's a really fun kind of conversation about like, what do you think the role of UX designers are on a team, on a security team? Because most security teams, when you talk about security operations, security development, uh, when you talk about the security aspect, you normally UX is not part of that conversation. So I'd love to know if you have a thought, if you have a vision of what how UX contributes to security of a product or security of a company. It's actually an interesting question. I've never thought about it that way. Um, so let me just maybe paraphrase that question back. So I understand, um, are you asking how can a designer or design team add value in the delivery of a security product or how can they add value in the delivery of security itself? The second. So how can the UX UI designer help with securing a product or your company like this is like this is like there's a reason i asked this question 
I saw a funny debate on LinkedIn the last couple of days actually about some guy saying, hey, st I don't need any more UX, UI. I just need you to just deliver me a product. I'm sure they go, well, then you probably don't understand what UX and UI really does. And what's really interesting in the security world, we actually don't make use of UX all that often as much as you do in a traditional user-facing product. Uh, so just, yeah. just what are your thoughts? And if you don't have a thought, that's totally cool. Uh, this is just something as you're talking about these structured teams. I'm wondering how, where do you think the role of a UX is in this? Yeah. No, that's interesting. Um, securing a product with a design team. I've never thought about that before. That's a definitely interesting concept. Um, I knew, I know for us though, I mean, we, we use designers on our, on our teams all the time, but they're not really thinking in the way of security. Um, you know, they're thinking in the way of like user personas and mm -hmm. what value do we, do we deliver per user persona? And then, um, uh, how do they make that as easy as possible for that user persona to get, to get their, to their action. Um, yeah. and so, and maybe that's, maybe that's the direction we can take it is, um, building security in is how do we get teams to as quick of an action with as, as less steps as possible? Um, using UX design. That's, it's an interesting concept for real. Um, well, I, I, I would have to think on that one. Give me, give awesome. me a cheat code. I stumped you with something related to culture yeah. organization. Yeah, this is yeah. like, I don't know. It's something for me, I, I've seen it come up recently. I've just had some thoughts on like, is there a role? Actually, there should be a role for UX on both. How do you have your security functions viewed as a product towards the rest of your company? Plus, how do you have security features as a product within a product where you, you actually have design about like, I think the way you said, like, how do you make the least number of clicks to get what you're trying to get at on security? And so anyway, random thoughts as we talk about culture, uh, but it's something for you to think about. What is the role yeah, I mean, when that's in security? Yeah, I, I would say, maybe let me throw this out at out, out you and um, how we're designing it into our platform and how we're differentiating and how we're integrating those concepts of less clicks and getting to action and, you know, driving that cultural and behavior change is the concept of gamification. Um, mm -hmm. and so, um, we're way out in front with this concept of, you know, let's be honest, everybody at IT has an ego, <laughs> they, yeah. they, they like to demonstrate their mastery. They love recognition. Um, right. And so how do you actually motivate teams to build security and, and, or, um, become upskilled at specific topics around security and compliance? You know, how do we get them to, um, to change? And frankly, it's not just about people in the trenches that needs to change. It's the, what I call concept of money ball and data driven, um, management. Right. And so, uh, yep. how can you kind of um, uh, pull those concepts up le several layers to management leadership to where they can understand and drive that change that they actually need to be in charge of um, to enable the people down in the trenches, the practitioners, things like that. And so uh, gamification becomes a, um, a how do you give people rewards, points, awards um, that they can carry with them their entire careers demand more you know salary when they want to go to the next job and things like that yeah. um and really demonstrate the mastery of their learning and their upskilling and you know in their current companies being identified as security champions and um as a manager or a leader if i can see all my security champions and you know i can reward, reward them monetarily I can give bonuses. It's easy. It's all data, data driven. Um, but also I can leverage those people and their expertise to make everybody else in the organization better. Right. So that we're talking about mentoring, coaching, and when I hate this term, but like do more with less, um, the whole industry is kind of like 
killed that term. Um, everybody's talking about tool consolidation most of the time on that, but like really do more with less should be focused on people. Like how do we, um, enable and empower our, uh, existing resources, um, to, to do better. Cause like, let's, you know, stop throwing more tools at it. You just, because you're going to find more vulnerabilities or find more yeah. stuff does not mean your people can actually handle it. Right. And so you can, you can buy the Lambo tool when you really only needed a Corolla tool, um, because your people couldn't handle either one of them, but how are you enabling your people to do that? Right. And so, um, hey, I think, I think the gamification is big. Like being able to reward people and have them understand that as they improve their views of security and views of security processes, they're actually worth that. Because you're right, right now, you know, not to knock on the U.S. Department of Defense, but anyone in the DOD who has taken online CBTs for your annual security training, it is mind numbing, and it's theoretically gamified, but it is not, and it doesn't and it doesn't make anyone more secure. And so, yeah, if you can start approaching that and get a really good solutions out there. I think that'd be fantastic. Um, and to, to that point, Enrique, is like, we as humans learn, like, back to my college statement, is like, a lot of the stuff that you learn in college, you know, you forget until, you know, 10, 15 years down the road, yeah. you run into that problem. You're like, oh, that's where this kind of hits in. But then you have to go relearn it, right? Um, and so us as as people, as humans, like, we learn in context and when we just created that challenge or problem or issue. And so the serving up training that is gamified to um, people as they create the issue. And it's like, hey, you just created this thing, this vulnerability, whatever it is, um, this compliance issue, and they can learn on the fly. Oh, yep. shoot. I didn't know that. I can learn on the fly what I did, why it matters, and how to fix it. Um, like that's, that's powerful, right? Um, that's where that, that knowledge is actually going to stick. And then wisdom is built when you can continuously implement that thing that you learned. Right. And so that, that all of those concepts are baked into the gamification, um, that we're doing. So I got one more question for you. So, uh, as you know, a lot of our listeners are really out of the national security community and national security tech community. So you guys did not start off as a military focused, national security focused company. You're focused on, you know, how do you make security of applications better? But I know you're kind of looking in that direction. So tell me a little about what your what your plan is. Are you looking to drive into national security? Where do you think this you fit in the in the, in the ecosystem here? Yeah, I mean, um, our initial go to market was, um, you know, focused on software companies. And um, we're we're very passionate about you know whether it's uh, critical infrastructure or it's um, private markets is fundamentally we're all built on um, software that's not very great <laughs> and um, and it's aging and it's delicate and you know simple things can can kind of hurt us right and so obviously I you know being a, a U.S. citizen grew up in all of my, all of my family on both sides have always been military, right? Um, I'm kind of the, the, uh, the, uh, black sheep, I guess you, you could say that I didn't go into the military, but like, um, but I'm still passionate about my country. Right. Yeah. And so, um, it is always like, yeah, how do we get into the federal space? And, and, um, but the problem is, is like all the innovation, um, that's coming out that the federal space should be leveraging cannot afford both cost and time to get FedRAMP certified or whatever certified. So yeah, you know it's a it's a it's an it, it blocks us right. And so you know we're trying to partner with several companies like you and you know um, a couple other ones that I mentioned previously is they have that same argument and they're tell they're talking to the leaders in the Fed federal space that. You know, all of these requirements that you guys want, um, they, the, the commercial space has it. There's startups that have these things that can actually move the needle for you, but the requirements to actually get in and help are way too high. The cost of entry yeah. is way too high. And so it's, it's both hurting the startup and it's both, and it's hurting them as well. Right. And so, you know, it's one of those things like, um, 
are we still going to operate in status quo or are we actually going to like look at the problem and solve the problem and if there's if there's commercial opportunities that can help you why not maybe like lift lift some of the gates there and you know do what commercial companies do do proof of concepts you know see if it works see if it's not vaporware like you know yep. if you're buying stuff that's like 5 10 15 years old to to solve modern problems uh I, I shouldn't have to say it out loud but like really <laughs> um well yeah we can't keep selecting products based off of powerpoint decks we actually have to sit yes. and act and yeah so yes. look I, i'm excited with what you guys are trying to do i completely agree with moving security earlier in the process making sure everyone on your team is focused on it make sure the culture is built around it because you're right when, if you want commercial companies or you want go the government to be able to get through all these accreditation rules and compliance rules, we can't keep just making them longer, longer processes. We have to find ways to automate. We have to find ways to uh, to inherit uh, between various companies as easy as you build stacks of technology together. So, no, I, I'm. Uh, it's, it's great to talk to you. It's great to see you. Uh, I know we'll have some, you and I will have some more conversations about a few of these things, especially about, like how do we tackle these big compliance issues. But no, I really appreciate you taking the time uh, to be on the show with us. Awesome. No, it was a, it was definitely a great conversation and I appreciate the time and, um, I'm going to have to go stew on some of this stuff now and go down some rabbit. <laughs> Good. I, I like to make people think. So uh, I did my job. Yes, sir. Yeah.